Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are starting CMSA Colloquium. Today, we are excited to have Maria Angela Lisanti from Princeton University. Maria Angela uh, has completed an undergraduate uh, work uh, on condensed matter physics at Harvard and then a PhD on high energy physics in Stanford. But she has been active, an active researcher ever since high school when, when uh, an, a de device she constructed has earned her awards from Intel and Siemens. Um, Maria Angela uh, will talk today about your uh, exciting results on dark matter. Maria Angela, take it away. Oh, hey, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to join you all virtually today. I, I hope you're all doing as, as well as possible under the circumstances. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to talk to you a bit today about some uh, recent work over the last few years that my group has been doing, um, where we've been uh, taking advantage of data from the Gaia satellite to try and map out the dark matter distribution uh, locally in, in the halo. So I'm, I'm starting off here on this introduction slide uh, with an image that's of the Nix goddess. Um, and this is mainly meant uh, to be a bit of a teaser because Nix is going to come back and play a bit of a role later on in the talk. Um, so you just have to kind of keep an eye out for uh, when she makes an, an appearance again later in the talk. Um, but I want to start off his, a bit, with a bit of history. Um, the, uh, our attempt at trying to, to map out the dark matter in the Milky Way uh, really started in the 1970s and 1980s um, with work by uh, Vera Rubin and, and collaborators. Oh, my slide is not advancing. One second. There we go. Uh, by Vera Rubin and collaborators, um, where they were looking at rotations of uh, galactic disks. And what they found was um, the fact that as you move further, further out, farther away from the center of the galaxies, the rotational velocity of, let's say, gas that's in that galaxy uh, seems to asymptote. Um, and that's contrary to what you'd expect if you were predicting the motions of that gas or those stars uh, based purely on Newtonian gravity. Um, Newton's theory would predict, in contrast, that the rotational velocity would, would fall off um, at large radii uh, as 1 over square root of r. So this discrepancy between the observed rotational velocity and the expected rotational velocity um, really strongly indicated that there was some, some new exciting thing that was going on. And there were several, there's several possibilities for how you can explain this. So one is you might say, okay, well, perhaps my theory of gravity is incorrect and um, I need to go back in and modify uh, Newton's law, essentially, to give me the pink curve here as opposed to the yellow one. And there has been some work, extensive work on this, um, since these, these early periods, um, they face a number of challenges. Uh, one big challenge is that they haven't been able to consistently reproduce uh, data that we're getting from the early universe, so from um, cosmological observations. Um, but another challenge also comes in um, closer to home, so to speak. Uh, in particular, if we um, just look at stars, the motions of stars in our galaxy. Um, what these modifications to Newton's laws of gravity seek to do is to explain the fact that the radial accelerations of these stars um, is typically much larger than we would predict using Newton's laws. So you modify Newton's laws to try to give you an enhancement in that radial acceleration um, such that you could then reproduce the, the rotation curves. Um, now, what these theories also do is they will have a consequence on the vertical accelerations of the stars as well. So if you have a theory that um, needs to predict a larger radial acceleration, what it 
does is it simultaneously predicts a, um, an enhancement in the vertical acceleration of the stars. And that's something that we can actually just go out and look for in the data, um, especially locally near where the, the sun is in the Milky Way. We have some really good data on the vertical accelerations of stars. And um, what we find is that the vertical velocity of the stars is not enhanced to the same degree that you would expect from these modifications to, to gravity. Um, so there's a number of challenges then to, to making this uh, particular avenue work. The alternate is um, to posit that there's additional matter in the galaxy. Um, so to say that beyond the visible matter that we can see in the galactic disk, there's something else that's out there that's enhancing that total mass. And when you increase the total mass, then you should be increasing the rotational velocity of the stars, and then that would be consistent with the rotation curve data. In this picture, um, we add in, we call it dark matter, this new matter that we add into the galaxy, dark because we don't see it. Um, so that's in contrast to the visible matter that's in the disk. And in order for this additional matter to be able to explain the flat rotation curve data, um, it implies that the mass that's in this dark component needs to increase linearly with radius. Um, and the, the, the picture that we have in mind here is that we have our own galaxy in the, um, oops, there we go, in the center here. So that's the visible part of the galaxy. And it's surrounded by a massive halo of dark matter. Um, the scales here are actually really quite dramatic in the sense that the, the radius here for this dark halo is almost about, or the predicted radius for that dark halo is about 10 times larger than the observed radius of the disk. So this is a, a massive amount of uh, additional stuff that we're adding there, and it extends out um, very far. Um, so the, the, if you think about it as like a cloud of dark matter, the dark matter particles are sort of zipping around in this cloud, um, they're not really doing anything terribly interesting. They're not relativistic or anything. They're, they're actually just non-relativistic. They're moving around at like 200 kilometer, kilometers a second, which is about as fast as our sun rotates around the center of the galaxy. So, you know, non-relativistic, um, in that sense, pretty vanilla um, particles that are flying around in this, in this massive halo. Now, obviously, what we would want to be able to do is to detect one of these uh, dark matter particles directly. Um, that would be the, um, the, the best confirmation of this hypothesis. And the, there's a variety of, of, of experiments on Earth, so terrestrial experiments, that are seeking to do uh, precisely this. The basis for these experiments is essentially looking for one of these dark matter particles flying through the Earth and then hitting the detector. Um, so I'm showing here an image. Um, this is a sketch of a, a xenon detector. So it's essentially a tub of xenon. And uh, what you're looking for is a dark matter particle that um, is going to be flying in, and then it would hit the um, xenon nucleus. Um, the dark matter particle would ricochet off, um, and the nucleus would, would jiggle a bit because it was hit by something. Um, we'd never be able to see the dark matter particle in this collision, but what we can hope to see is the, the jiggling nucleus from that xenon atom. Um, so these are, are highly, they need to be highly sensitive experiments, um, extremely low, and, and they run in extremely low background environments, so usually at the bottom of mines or underneath mountains. Um, and the, you know, there's, like, they've reached an incredible sensitivity just over the last decade or so. So it's, a, it's an extensive program and very, very exciting. Um, now, what, the, what these experiments should see, the rate at which they would see a detection, depends critically on how much dark matter we expect to be located around the Earth, to be flying through the Earth for that matter. So that rate is going to depend, um, as I've written down at the bottom of the slide, both on the, the velocity of the dark matter particle, on its scattering cross-section, um, and then also just on the number of these dark matter particles that are around. Um, so that really puts an emphasis on the need to be able to actually uh, 
have a good accounting for how much dark matter we expect to be surrounding us in our own little corner of the galaxy near where the sun is and, and where the earth is. That's a direct input for interpreting the results of any of these experiments. Um, attempts at, at doing this started very early on. So just even when the, um, the first rotation curve measurements were coming out. So this is early work by Ostreicher and Peebles, um, David Spurgle, Katie Fries. Um, and the idea there was just to say, okay, well, we, we see a flat rotation curve. We want to be able to come up with some model for the way the dark matter should be distributed in the galaxy. Where do we start? So we're going to start in the simplest possible place. Um, and we're just going to assume that the dark matter is uh, a collisionless fluid. And uh, if it's a collisionless fluid, then um, we're going to model its fluid mass um, as follows and assume that it's conserved. Then we're going to add in some additional assumptions to our model. So we're going to assume that the dark matter is in steady state, that the velocities are isotropic, and of course that we can reproduce the flat rotation curve data because that's essentially um, that's the, the target goal here is, is to make sure that we're consistent with that, that data. And when you combine this um, conservation of fluid mass equation with these additional assumptions that get added in, what you get is a, a prediction that the dark matter should have a number density that falls off as one over r squared and its velocities should be distributed as, a, as Maxwell Boltzmann. So this is essentially some kind of isothermal distribution for the dark matter. This model has essentially been in place since um, these early papers that I cite here. Um, it's referred to as the standard halo model. Um, any results from these um, dark matter experiments are typically presented assuming this model. Um, so it's pretty much become the go-to uh, in the field. Uh, fortunately, we are at a period where we can come back and actually look at some additional new data and see whether or not um, you know, to really actually test whether or not this model holds up. And in particular, what we want to do is be able to reassess the assumptions that go into this scenario. Um, so we have the steady state assumption, isotropy, um, that are all kind of coming into play. And with the new data that we have at hand, we can come back and actually just ask whether or not these assumptions hold up and are, are correct to be making. So let's focus in particular on this assumption here of steady state. And I want to just take a moment to, to ask, what does it mean for a galaxy like the Milky Way to be in steady state? Um, the way I like to think about it is um, as, a, as a family tree in some way. So the way galaxies like the Milky Way grow over time is by eating up smaller galaxies. Um, those smaller galaxies that get eaten up essentially end up donating their matter, both their visible matter, their stars and their gas, and also their dark matter um, to us. And then we, we in turn grow bigger. And, you know, as of, you know, looking back in time, we essentially want to be able to reconstruct that history of how our Milky Way formed by figuring out what all of these other galaxies are that we, we ate up in the process. And when you think about it, there's a variety of ways in which this can occur. So there's one extreme where the process is really fairly quiet. So for example, at some very early time, you had two galaxies that combined together, then they pretty much just sat there. Um, the system just had enough time to come into equilibrium, nothing much else ended up happening over you know, many billions of years. And then we have the Milky Way that we observe today. So that limit we'll call sort of a quiet merger history. There isn't very much that's going on. And we can contrast that with a much more active picture of how our galaxy could have grown up, where a bunch of galaxies could have combined together, you know, up until very close to the present day, ultimately giving us the Milky Way that we see today. And in this limit, the history is much more active. Um, the system does not have time to kind of come into equilibrium because it's always just getting bombarded by some other galaxy that it's going to um, it's going to dissolve and donate its its bits. And um, yeah, so this case here is the one this active merger history here. If that's actually what happened to the Milky Way, oh goodness, there we go. If that's actually what happened to the Milky Way, then that steady state hypothesis uh, would be would be broken. 
So the steady state hypothesis really only applies in the case where the merger history is really quiet and we, um, the system has enough time, the system here being the entire galaxy, has enough time to uh, come into equilibrium and to settle down, essentially. So um, when we seek to try to figure out, put together a map for the dark matter in the Milky Way, what it really involves us is understanding this formation process um, for the galaxy itself, understanding whether or not the merger history was quiet or active, understanding exactly what our relatives are, what galaxies um, joined up to form, um, to form us, and then to use that information to figure out how the dark matter um, is distributed. So um, over the course of this talk, um, the first part, I want to really just focus a little bit on the theory of how, what well, we call it galactic cannibalism, so how our galaxy ate up all of these other galaxies, um, and what should happen to the stars and the dark matter in that process. Um, and this first part is going to be um, definitely theory-based. We're going to be looking at simulation data um, and, and really kind of digging in deep there to, to understand these correlations and how the dark matter and stellar distributions evolve as a function of time um, as this uh, this merger history develops. Um, then in the second half of the talk, um, we'll be able to build on this theory foundation and start looking at data from Gaia to actually, you know, get our hands dirty and figure out exactly what happened in our own galaxy and what the implications are for the dark matter um, near, near us. So let's begin um, by actually just looking at some simulation of how a galaxy forms. And as I've already emphasized, um, in, in the lambda cold dark matter paradigm, galaxies like the Milky Way are going to form by um, the mergers of other smaller galaxies. Now, the, the video I'm about to play is going to show you a simulation of this happening for a galaxy that's very similar, uh, modeled to be very similar to the Milky Way. Um, this is a simulation that's referred to as the FIRE simulation. So FIRE here stands for feedback in realis realistic environments. Um, these are some of the state-of-the-art simulations that we have available today um, that show how galaxies like the Milky Way form and how the gas, the stars, and the dark matter in the galaxy evolves as a function of time, starting from the very early stages up until today. Um, the movie I'm going to show you is going to sh just show you the stars. Um, the simulation is keeping track of the dark matter as well, but that's not included in the video. So I'm going to get this running. The bright spots, oh goodness, okay, one second, here we go. So the, the brighter the area in that movie, that means that you have a higher concentration of stars. Um, and what you can see is that there's these um, galaxies, so these bright patches that are flying in and, um, and they're combining to form that, that uh, main disk. Um, so let me just play that again, just to emphasize a few points. So in this initial stage, there's a bunch of these galaxies that are combining and actually the process is really quite violent and almost sort of chaotic. Um, once the, the disk forms and you can identify it, it does seem like things kind of quiet down a little bit. You have fewer of these mergers that are occurring as a function of time. Um, and then this is the, the way the disk looks today. Um, so these simulations are extremely powerful for understanding how um, a galaxy like ours could have evolved as a function of time, but they aren't a direct representation in the sense that we don't know exactly how many galaxies combine to form the Milky Way. That's what we need to look in the data to find out. Um, but the simulations do give us a realistic example of plausible scenarios. So they're a really good sandbox to play around with and try to understand um, what could be happening for our own galaxy. So what I want to do next is to kind of go into the simulation and break it down a bit um, so that to emphasize what, you know, what's happening early on when a satellite galaxy is falling into the Milky Way and then what happens as that process evolves from there. So when you have um, initially some, some galaxy that's falling in, it's going to end up experiencing tidal forces um, from the Milky Way 
because um, that's a much more massive system. And those gravitational tidal forces are going to be stripping off dark matter and stars from that satellite galaxy as it falls in. The material that's removed from that satellite galaxy sometimes is referred to as tidal debris. Um, debris because it's just sort of left behind and tidal because it's um, being removed by these tidal gravitational forces. Um, and initially that, that debris essentially just ends up roughly following the path that the satellite galaxy um, is taking. So you can just sort of imagine it being like left behind as a trail um, behind that, that galaxy. And we can, we actually have direct evidence of these kinds of um, streams that form, these debris streams that form, um, at least uh, with stars. We obviously can't see them for the dark matter. Um, one of the most prominent and spectacular is uh, uh, arising from a, a known galaxy that's in the middle of, of being eaten up by the Milky Way. It's called Sagittarius. Um, and in this next video here, I'm going to show you uh, um, what the process looks like. So this is um, a simulation of Sagittarius as it's falling into the Milky Way galaxy. And you can see that as it's being disrupted, it's leaving behind this trail of stellar debris. Um, and we can actually see in data these different, these individual loops, and those loops roughly trace out the path that's taken by the Sagittarius galaxy as it's falling in. Now, Sagittarius is pretty spectacular. We can make out these large loops. We also can still see the galaxy today, so it hasn't gotten completely digested yet. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a really nice example of, of how you get these beautiful structures that form um, during these merging events in, in the galaxy. So what we can do in the simulation data, so in the fire simulation, is we can go in and find candidate streams um, that come from some merger event. And we can look at what the, how the dark matter and the stars from those streams um, behave. In general, the streams that form will typically be very narrow spatially, um, which you could have already seen from that um, movie of Sagittarius falling in. Um, and also they typically end up having um, coherent velocities. Um, so all of the matter in that stream tends to be flowing in, in one direction pr pretty coherently. And when we look in the fire simulation and we find candidates of, of stellar streams and then also look to see what the dark matter in the associated stream is doing, we indeed see, um, and as illustrated here in this um, plot, um, the speed distributions um, for the stars, which are shown in pink, are pretty coherent. So they're, they're peaked here for this particular example around 400 kilometers a second. And then also for the dark matter, the velocities are, are are fairly coherent. Um, so in this particular example that I'm showing here from fire, um, you have both dark matter and a stellar stream that forms. Um, we see this in the coherence of the velocity distri uh, speed distributions. Um, and one point I do want to make is that the both the dark matter and the stars have roughly approximately similar um, speeds, um, but the correspondence isn't perfect. And that's something that we generically see when comparing um, features in the dark matter and stellar distributions for some of these very recent mergers. Now, um, let's go back to our little schematic here. We have our galaxy that's falling in. Um, now we're just going to sort of image what happens um, after the system evolves a bit. So the satellite galaxy, as it falls in, um, will make orbits around the host. And in this process where it's orbit, orbiting around and falling in, it's losing all of this material, um, stars and dark matter. And all of that material is essentially kind of getting mixed up together. Um, it's starting to form kind of a, a little blob of stuff in the region. You can no longer make out individual streams because it's all getting wound up. So the spatial coherence in this case uh, just gets washed out. Um, but interestingly, you do end up seeing some velocity, interesting velocity behavior that um, survives. And that ends up being key for being able to actually identify the fact that such a merger occurred in the past. Um, in the fire simulations, we can identify some of these not so recent mergers. So ones that sort of came in and have had some time to evolve and, and orbit around and fall in. And what we find in these cases is that 
Um, spatially, there's nothing interesting to see. All of the material is kind of just all spread out. The stars, the dark matter, it's all spread out. Um, but when you look in the velocity space, you still end up having some, some interesting features. So for example, um, in the figure I'm showing here, this is a plot of radial velocities for material that's been stripped from one of these mergers. And both the dark matter and the stars have this kind of interesting shape there. It's bit bimodal. And um, that bimodality that you see there is actually a function of the orbit of the satellite that came in. Um, so this particular shape that you're seeing here in the velocity behavior is actually coming from the fact that the orbit of the satellite is, um, is pretty radial. Um, also for these older mergers, the dark matter and the stars actually have a pretty good correspondence with each other. And that's really heartening from an observational point of view because it tells us that if we can go out and actually map the stars in these kinds of substructures, then we have um, good reason to believe that the dark matter from the same mergers would follow very similar distributions. And lastly, um, let's consider the case where we have these satellite mergers, but they occurred, um, they essentially evolved to the point where everything got completely disrupted. So we had our galaxy fall in, it's made a lot of orbits, and now it's just totally disrupted. Uh, and we're just left with the material that's left behind. So these would be examples of the oldest stars and dark matter in the Milky Way. And um, when we go look in simulations at the really old components of the stars and the really old components of the dark matter, what we find is that um, they've all kind of come into equilibrium by the present day. And um, if we look here at the, this distribution, um, equilibrium here, I mean that like everything looks fairly Gaussian, kind of boring, no interesting shape to the distributions. And indeed, actually, when we look at all components of the velocity, they all look fairly isotropic. And in addition, all of the dark matter and the stars here have an extremely good correspondence with each other. So that tells us that the dark matter um, that came from these really old mergers um, is tracked really well by the stars from those same mergers. Okay, so let me kind of summarize um, the philosophy that we're going to take moving forward. The goal here is to try to come up with a, a distribution, a mapping for the local dark matter um, near the solar position. Um, the reason we want to do this is because that mapping is going to have a direct implication for any terrestrial search for the dark matter. The dark matter near us essentially came from these satellite galaxies that merged with, with our own. Um, some of the satellites that come in will have stars in them, and we're referring to those as luminous galaxies, and then some of them don't have stars in them. Um, where we're going to get some traction moving forward is we're going to start looking, start trying to understand the dark matter that came from these luminous satellite galaxies. Um, that's going to give us a, a, a way forward um, because we can use the stars from those galaxies to, to infer the fact that the murders actually occurred. And our task in going into the data is going to be to try to figure out um, what fraction of the dark matter came in from the really old mergers, what fraction is in substructure from some of these not so recent mergers, and what might have come in much more recently. Um, because the velocity information and also the spatial distribution of the dark matter from each of these different classes um, would look different and would also have different kinds of implications for, for the experimental searches. So we're in a really fortunate position um, that we have an amazing uh, new data set that is actually allowing us to do this for the first time. And what I want to do now is just introduce a bit um, this data set and talk about how we can go in and, and mine it for this information so that we can actually fill in this part of the diagram here. So the data that I'm referring to um, is coming from the Gaia satellite. Uh, Gaia is the follow-up astrometric survey uh, to the Hipparchos mission, which occurred in the early 90s. It's um, shown here on the slide. Uh, it, the satellite launched in December 2013, and the second data release occurred a couple years ago. The third data release is going to happen um, later this year. The mapping um, that Gaia provides of all of, of about a billion stars in the Milky Way is unprecedented. Um, this is about 1% of all of the Milky Way stars, which may seem like a small fraction, but it's actually the largest 
amount of data we've ever had on stars in the Milky Way. So that 1% is actually uh, um, a huge advance forward. We've never had that many stars. And to kind of put this in perspective, um, here's an image of the Milky Way disk, but rotated, so it's, it's vertical. Um, so here's the center of the galaxy, and our sun is here. And the sort of the region where Hipparchos had given us really good data um, is indicated by this small little dash circle um, in here. And where Gaia gives us data that's of comparable uh, accuracy is indicated by this circle here. So um, huge uh, improvement in terms of area being covered. And, and actually, eventually, Gaia is actually going to be able to give us like some really um, great proper motion data all the way out to this um, outer circle. Um, so with this uh, unprecedented data, what we want to do is essentially go on something of an archaeological dig in our galaxy. So in the same way that when fossil hunters are looking for um, hints that some creature walked around our, our, our Earth many, many years ago, you know, they'll go out, if they find a fossil, they'll use information about the shape of the fossil, the environment it was found in, perhaps they'll do some radioactive dating to try to guess at the creature that that fossil originated from. So that we can go from this picture here of a, you know, pretty boring uh, bone structure to a much more exciting image. Um, this is a representation of a Tyrannosaurus rex um, with, with feathers, which um, uh, I hadn't fully appreciated until I was working on this slide that there's a lot of debate going on in the community about whether or not a T-Rex should have feathers or not. Um, but apparently there is a subset that does believe that Tyrannosaurus rex should have feathers and this is what it would have looked like. Uh, in any case, what we want to try to do with the Gaia data is kind of similar to this. So we want to start with the map of all of the stars um, as, as determined by Gaia, then using information about the position of those stars, their velocity, and perhaps any chemical abundance information of those stars, we want to then make this jump to infer something about the distribution of um, where those stars came from and you know, whether or not there was some early galaxy that they originated from that uh, fell into our galaxy and is being disrupted in our galaxy. Um, now, this archaeological expedition that we're going to go on is, uh, is, is, is extremely challenging. It's essentially a, a, a rare signal search. Um, and you can sort of see this here. Um, in the sense that when you look at the Gaia map up in the left hand corner, most of the stars that you see, where, so where the map is lighting up is right here along the disk plane. Um, and the, what we're actually interested in are going to be stars that are coming from these satellite galaxies that merged with ours. So the stars that are going to be coming from those mergers are kind of spread out in different locations. They're not necessarily concentrated in this disk plane. And there are just comparably many fewer stars uh, in the data set that correspond to this versus the stars that are actually in the Milky Way disk. So the task at hand is really like trying to find a needle in a haystack because you're really trying to dig into this extremely large data set to find the sort of few special stars there that would tell you that something special happened in, in our galaxy. So uh, we've taken several approaches to doing this over the years, and I'm just going to um, highlight for you some of the results that we've gotten both ways. So the first approach um, I'll refer to as human-centric, um, which is perhaps a bit of a strange name, but that's meant to sort of emphasize the fact that with this approach, we're really going to try to um, by hand impose a lot of restrictions on the data that will minimize as much as possible any contamination um, from the Milky Way disk. Um, so I'll show you what we've gotten, uh, how far we got using this approach. Um, this was really spearheaded in large part by a postdoc, Lena Nassib, who will be starting a faculty position at MIT in the next year. She's currently at Carnegie Institute. Um, here's the uh, region where we uh, looked at the data. So we were specifically trying to avoid this area here in the galactic disk, because as I said, we were like specifically trying to um, remove as much data as possible from the region where 
um, we know there was going to be a large contamination. Um, so we focused instead on these regions up and below the galactic plane. Even here, when we by hand remove um, the dominant background, um, it's still a bit challenging to identify structures that could be coming from these mergers. Um, essentially, the problem boils down to doing, um, it's a clustering problem. Um, so what we have is a multidimensional space where each dimension in that space is set by um, uh, data that we have. So in particular, in this case, we have information about the velocities of the stars and also some information about their chemical properties. So you can think of each of those as different axes in this multidimensional space. And then what we want to do is essentially find groupings in that multidimensional space that um, we think are associated either with the disk or with some of these other interesting mergers. So what I'm showing here on this slide is um, it's just a schematic of how we approach the data. So we plot it in this multidimensional space. So here's a projection of it. Here's a chemical, uh, chemical abundance here on one axis. This is rotational velocity on the y, um, x axis. And what I'm showing here is roughly the region where we'd expect stars from these mergers to, to land. And in comparison, here's the region where we'd expect stars from the Milky Way disk to land. And so if our clustering algorithm works as we'd like it to work, it should efficiently separate out this grouping here from this other grouping here that would be coming from the disk. Now, obviously, as I've drawn this here, I was trying to make this seem very clean and clear cut. This is what it actually looks like when we open up the, the box. And this is just the data um, plotted on, um, on these axes. So vertical axis here is uh, just chemical abundance of stars. Um, horizontal axis is different components of the velocity of the stars. And you can see that when we actually look at the data, this seems like it becomes a lot harder, like this actually just looks like one big blob. But what we really want to know is whether or not there's any statistical preference for breaking up all of this information here into distinct components. To do this, we um, apply a full Gaussian mixture model analysis. So we have um, a likelihood function that's set up um, to uh, account for different components that can be added to the model. And um, then we run this likelihood on the data and see how many components are preferred and what their distributions should be. Here I'm showing you the result of that likelihood analysis. So these curves, these circles, um, as drawn on, overlaid on this data diagram, are actually from the likelihood analysis. They're not curves that I've drawn myself. And what you can see is that there are essentially three different components that the um, mixture model analysis picks out. Um, so it's picking here. Um, this green circle is actually identifying stars that belong to the Milky Way disk. And the way you can see that is that um, these stars are kind of clustered around rotational velocities that correspond with the rotational velocity of our disk. So that's good. That part makes sense. Um, then we have the pink curve in each of these panels. Um, that contribution is the oldest. Um, this vertical axis, as I said, is chemical abundance. But as you go down here, you're going to older stars, essentially. It's a proxy for age. So the smaller um, the chemical, comp the lower value of this chemical composition, the older the stars is. So this pink region here are the stars that are the oldest ones. They're also roughly isotropic. Um, so if you look at it in velocity space, they're, um, the dispersion isn't very different in each of the velocity components. Um, then there's a third contribution that the algorithm finds, which is this blue region here. Um, that's the one that's actually quite interesting because that's like an intermediate set of stars. They're not so old. Um, so for our purposes, where we want to kind of try to understand what this all means for dark matter, the, the way this corresponds is these old stars, the ones circled in pink, would be mapping out the dark matter that came from very, very old mergers. And then the stars circled in blue would be indicating dark matter that came in from a more recent merger. And actually, that more recent merger is quite interesting. 
Um, and people have only discovered this once um, the second Gaia data release um, became public. Um, this was first noted by Vasily Belakurov and collaborators and Amina Helmi and collaborators. Um, what they found was that there's essentially a single merger that dragged in the majority of the stars in the inner part of the Milky Way. Um, and that's what's being shown here in this simulation. Um, that merger event, that, sat, that galaxy is called uh, Gaia Enceladus. And um, it allows us to come back to our family tree that we started off at the beginning of this talk and actually make some progress forward and pin things down a bit. So we had this, um, these two extremes that I presented, one that was really quiet, quiet murder history, another one that was very active murder history, um, with the discovery of Gaia and Saladis that actually sort of pins down some relative that we have. Um, so we now know that there was a definitely a, a fairly significant merger that happened early on in the Milky Way's evolution, so about 7 billion years ago, and the galaxy that collided with our own had um, a stellar mass of roughly 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 solar masses at that point in time. So this is kind of like finding uh, an old relative in your family tree. Um, Gaia Enceladus is a, an old relative of ours in the Milky Way, and now we've been able to see um, uh, discovery based off of the, the residue of the material that is essentially left behind. And the Gaussian mixture analysis that we performed lets us do a much, a pretty careful accounting for how much material came in from Gaia Enceladus, and then also um, allows us to do a mapping from um, the material that we're seeing from the stellar component to the fractions that we expect in the dark matter. So how much of the dark matter came in from the earliest mergers and how much would have also come in from Enceladus. Um, so putting this back onto our little schematic diagram here, um, we see that even in this first attempt at looking at the Gaia data, we've already made a pretty significant step forward in our understanding of how the local dark matter is distributed. Um, we now know that it's not just dark matter from all very old mergers, that we have that component, but we also have a component of the dark matter that's coming from this new relative, Gaia Enceladus, um, that came in about seven, seven billion years ago. Um, so can we do even better than this? And the answer is yes. And the way we can push this forward is by taking advantage of some machine learning techniques. So this takes us to approach number two, um, which in contrast to the first one is more machine centric. Um, this effort was uh, led by um, both Lena as well as Brian Ostiak, who's um, a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, and the goal of uh, this part of the work was to see whether or not we can just let a machine determine whether or not a star is born in our galaxy or whether or not it comes from one of these satellite mergers. And if we're going to let the machine do this, um, we might as well let it do it in the region where it's going to be hardest uh, to try, uh, but also the region where it's going to be of most interest. So what we're going to do now is apply this um, neural net that we're going to develop in this area that's concentrated right in the disk plane. So precisely the region we were trying to avoid before, because um, we know that there's going to be a lot of disk contamination there. Um, and, but it's also the region that's of most interest for any dark matter direct detection experiment because we want to have the dark matter mapping close to where we are, so near, near where the sun is. The challenge here is that only about 1% of the stars in this region that I'm boxing in here are coming from these galaxy mergers. The other 99% are what we'll consider to be background. So the background here are just the stars in the disk, the stars that were born in the Milky Way galaxy. So that's the challenge that we're essentially putting forward to the machine. Can you accurately identify the 1% of stars um, in this region that um, came from these, these mergers? So we're going to use uh, deep neural networks to do this. Um, in okay. this kind of approach, um, you, you train the network on labeled photos. So in this cartoon, we're, it's being trained on images of a cat and a dog, and then Afterwards, after that training period, you then test, um, you can apply your network to an arbitrary photo. So in this, um, this image of a, a creature inside this laundry basket, 
And then based off of what the network learned from um, the training, it then decides and guesses whether or not that um, creature is a cat or a dog. Now, obviously what we're dealing with are not pictures of cats and dogs. What we're dealing with is data um, concerning stars that um, are either born in the galaxy or not born in the galaxy. But the approach we're gonna take is gonna be kind of similar in the sense that we're gonna train our neural network on um, simulations where we know what the truth is. So where we can label each star with um, whether or not it's a, a galaxy star or a merger star. And then after training the network on these simulations, then we can apply it to data from Gaia and see what, what it gives us. Um, the only way that this can work is if the simulations that you're training the network on um, are doing a good job at reproducing what's in our galaxy. And if we were doing this 10 years ago, there would have been no way that this would have even had any shot at working because the simulations were just not at that stage. Um, when people were first starting to run these galaxy formation simulations, they couldn't even get stable disks to form. And it's just been incredible the level of progress that has happened um, to get us to where we are today. So what I'm showing here uh, in the top panel is um, uh, a simulation um, results from one of these simulations. So it's a mock catalog, um, it's referred to as the Ananka mock catalog. And just for comparison, below it, I'm putting the data from Gaia. And you can see by eye that there's a lot of features that are reproduced in the mock data. Um, it's not a perfect correspondence and we don't expect it to be a perfect correspondence, but it's roughly getting the general behavior correct. Um, and that at least gives us a hope that this um, approach has a shot at being able to work. Um, I'm seeing that there's a, a question. Um, so maybe I, I pause, uh, Juven? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was going to ask earlier. Uh, earlier, you said that the one percent of the star uh, is from the merger merger star. Well, ninety nine percent is galaxy star. Is that correct? I just wonder uh, yeah. how how the how the data is obtained. How how do you know this? This one percent. How is that determined? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, yeah, so that's determined. So if you um, if you if you have a, um, I'm sorry, let me take a step back. So the Gaia data itself is huge. Um, um, so it's about a billion stars, but only a small fraction of that um, actually has uh, our stars that have, a, let's call it a, a more complete amount of information. So if you have stars that have really good kinematic observations coupled with um, really good chemical abundance information, so you, you also need some information about um, just their chemical properties, if you have that, then um, you have an ability to be able to determine a, a much better ability at being able to determine whether or not the stars belong in the disk or whether or not they came from the merger. So you can't uh, infer that 1% from the entirety of the Gaia data, but what you can do is look at the small subset that's particularly clean where, and where you have um, this additional information, this additional spectroscopic information that has the chemical abundances. And then based off of that sort of smaller, very um, clean and pure data set, you can estimate what the fraction should be. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but uh, there seems to be something, uh, let me see. It seems like earlier you said uh, perhaps there's 1% so the data is rare, so there could be some difficulty to, to uh, spot them. I, I'm just trying to un understand the logic. Uh, do we have 1% first, so the data is hard to collect? Or is that uh, we collect data and we find out this 1%? Maybe just the, the logic between which one we know first. Um, so we estimate that 1% first from much smaller data sets. So okay, there's other, I mean, before Gaia, there were also, there's other sort of spectroscopic surveys like Sloan, um, uh, et cetera, that uh, have uh, a much, they, they're looking at a much, much smaller number of stars overall, but the stars that they do look at, they have more information about. And so based off of studies that were done with these earlier surveys like Sloan, 
we can estimate that only about 1% of the stars in the disk are, are coming from, um, from the mergers. But that's, it's, a, it's a rough estimate from these smaller data sets. Um, and so what we, I mean, what, what the process that I'm about to explain to you is actually going to be a, a much better, I mean, this is how we can actually get that new fraction from the Gaia data. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what I'm showing you here is essentially the, the top is the simulation that we're going to use to train the network and the bottom is the data. Um, the, I won't have time to go into the details of the network configuration, but just um, very broadly, um, what we do is we train the network on one of these simulated galaxies. Um, then we apply a transfer training step where the um, last layer of the network is retrained on some small subset of data from the Milky Way galaxy where we have high confidence that they are stars that would have come from these mergers. And then we apply the network to all of the data um, in, in the Gaia catalog. Um, now, there's obviously a lot of concerns that arise when you are using or training a machine learning algorithm on a simulation and then applying it to actual data. Um, one big concern is what happens if the network is learning something specific about the simulated galaxy that actually is not consistent with our own galaxy. Um, we performed an extensive amount of testing on um, these simulated galaxies to better understand the biases that come um, from applying this network uh, training. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss more of this afterwards if there's any questions. Um, but for now, let me just show you the results of um, what we get after applying the neural network to the Gaia data. So the network output essentially is going to tell us the stars that have the highest probability um, of coming from one of these mergers. And what I'm plotting here in this panel um, are essentially distributions of those stars where the network is most confident of their origin. And I'm making these plots on different projections in velocity space. <clears throat> Based off of that network output, we again perform another mixture model analysis to see how many different components um, seem to exist in that data. And here we're finding um, three, three components. So the pink here is um, the part that's mostly isotropic in velocity. That's, those are the stars we think are coming in from the very, very old mergers. The blue thing that looks a bit like a peanut um, here that's uh, the kinematic distributions of this blue component here actually match the expectation for Enceladus, so our new relative that we discussed earlier. Um, so what this shows us actually quite explicitly is that material from that Enceladus galaxy has actually landed close to where the sun is. Um, so we do expect that dark matter from the Enceladus galaxy should be um, present uh, near, near the Earth. In addition, however, the clustering algorithm finds one additional component, which is circled in green, um, and that's uh, what we're calling NIX. Um, NIX is new. We didn't see it earlier, and we need to try to understand what, what it is. Um, it's not a few stars, so it's about several hundred stars, um, all kind of clustered together here. The, um, this is what the stars look like. This is how they're moving around where the sun is. So if the sun is located here and moving this way, um, these NIC stars are kind of moving diagonal relative to that position. You can see that their motion is pretty coherent. All of the stars, the arrows here are all pointing roughly in this direction here. So we have this large cluster of stars, like 200 stars. They're moving with these coherent velocities past where the sun's location is. Um, and their um, velocities are extremely, uh, they're very eccentric. So the stars are on very eccentric orbits. Um, and the kinematics of this is hard to explain um, unless the stars came from uh, a separate merger. Um, it could be that this is a stream of stars that's um, associated with some perturbation of the, um, the, the Milky Way disk, but it's a lot, um, it's a lot harder to be able to explain their kinematic distributions that way. So 
Nix might end up being one of the largest streams um, discovered that's passing through the sun. Um, and because it's so large, um, we really need to understand exactly um, what its origin is. Um, in order to do this, we're going to need to use, um, need to do some follow-up spectroscopic studies that will allow us to get better chemical abundance information about the stars. That will help us differentiate them from um, the disk uh, more effectively. Um, we can also get better measurements of the ages of the stars, which would also provide um, an important probe in understanding whether or not they came from these mergers. So these follow-up observational studies are all in the works to improve both the um, chemical abundance information we have for the stars and also their ages. And as I said, both of those things taken together will really help to clarify the picture of where um, the origin for this new um, extremely extensive stream that's passing by the solar position. The ramifications of this are significant. Um, because we know from simulations that um, streams like Nix, if they're formed from some of these mergers, would actually um, be an indication that there is a rotating disk of dark matter in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so there were some initial theory works on this um, from about a decade ago, um, showing that for certain types of mergers, you'd expect there to be this kind of fluffy dark matter disk um, that forms um, surrounding our stellar disk. Um, this is a pretty dramatic change from the, um, very pic the picture I showed you very early on where we think about the dark matter distribution as just being a single halo. Now, if this is correct, we have this picture of a halo in addition to um, a disk component that's kind of rotating along with the stellar disk in the Milky Way. And then, of course, where our experiments would be running, we'd be sitting right in the middle of this dark matter disk surrounded by this material that's kind of um, this dark matter material that's, that's rotating around in, in the galaxy. Um, so one of the things that uh, we're trying to understand now, this is actually work that's being led by an undergraduate here at Princeton, is um, how, do, how do these dark matter disks form? And um, are the, the, the formation when these disks do form, um, do we end up getting things that look like Nix? that get left behind. Um, this work will allow us to actually be able to say much more specifically what the associated dark matter distribution um, that you'd expect from a merger that's like Nix. Um, so this is just very preliminary results from the initial simulations that um, Ben has been running. Um, the little regions here, the gray regions show the, the Milky Way disk. On the left panel shows dark matter from um, one satellite galaxy as it's falling in, and on the right are the stars from that satellite galaxy. And as time progresses, you can see the satellite gets totally disrupted, and what it ultimately ends up leaving behind are um, stars that are kind of concentrated near where the stellar disk is, and then also this dark matter disk here on the left panel. And what this doesn't, these particular um, um, plots don't show is that both the stars and also the dark matter in this disk are essentially rotating around. Um, so that takes us essentially to the conclusions. Um, this is about as far as we've gotten. We've been able to harness this data from Gaia to fill in um, the branch of this um, uh, diagram here. Um, where we're mapping out the dark matter that came from these galaxies that hosted stars. And by digging deep into this extremely large data set, what we're finding is that the dark matter near the solar position um, uh, has three, what appears to be three contributions. So it has um, a component that came in very, very early on, so from the oldest mergers. It has a component that came in from um, our new Milky Way relative called Enceladus. And then it may also have this additional component that came in from this um, Nix merger. And I've left a question mark here because this is um, pending confirmation from these additional spectroscopic um, studies that are currently being done. Um, so we've made a lot of progress in this direction. Um, to really complete the mapping, we're going to need to start facing this arm of the diagram here, which um, uh, we haven't quite tackled yet, but we have some ideas for how to start doing that. Um, and then taken together, then that will give us our complete mapping. 
Um, we're also pushing forward on trying to um, further develop a lot of these machine learning techniques. Um, one particular direction that I'm really excited by um, we have a, is the following. We have this team here with Lena, Brian, and then um, postdocs and graduate students at Princeton who are all working on this. What we're asking is whether or not a machine can fill in some missing information in the Gaia data. So the large fraction of the Gaia data is incomplete and in particular is missing the radial velocities for the stars. Um, and what we want to know is whether or not a machine can actually accurately guess those velocities and provide us with its level of confidence in its guess. If we can do that, then um, our working data set will suddenly become significantly larger and we can essentially repeat the type of work I've um, described to you today with this larger data set. So that will improve um, the number of candidate stars we get for NICS, but also allow us to see if there's any additional structures that are there beyond, for example, NICS and Enceladus. Okay, so let me just conclude by um, going back to where we started. Um, so as I began this talk um, discussing flat rotation curves, um, in the Milky Way and how that initial discovery in the 1970s and early 1980s prompted the first models for how the dark matter is distributed in the halo. And the picture that came out of that initial work was a, it was a fairly simple model for that dark matter distribution. We assume that um, everything is in steady state. So it's um, a very, it's essentially just a one component model for that dark matter halo. Um, fortunately, with new data, um, it allows us to go back and revisit these models and to see um, what more might exist. And as it usually happens when you have more data, you end up finding some new and unexpected things. Um, so by digging deep into the Gaia data, we've been able to get information about um, galaxy mergers that built up the Milky Way galaxies. Um, we've done that uh, looking at substructure in stellar distributions. And then based off of theory work, um, looking at simulations and how dark matter is correlated with stars from these mergers, we could then end up mapping all of this into um, a halo model for the dark matter. Um, we still have a lot of work to do um, in, in understanding the components that are going into this empirical halo model, but we've been able to make a lot of progress so far um, with the data at hand. So I'm quite optimistic um, about what we'll be able to do in the, in the coming years. So with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any questions that, that might, might arise. Thank you very much, Maria Angela. If you have questions, please just unmute yourself. Joanne, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk, beautiful talk. Uh, there's a data, I think you, you show, done with the Princeton undergrad about the dark matter disk. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question. Uh, so, so the, Yes. So the key message is that the, the stars from the merger will be localized in some region while the dark matter from the merger will be spread around, but still has some, some core around the stars. Is that the message you want to convey here? Yeah, that's right. So in general, the dark matter distribution will be a bit more spread out than the stellar distribution of the stuff that gets um, removed. Um, and so yeah, I'll just run through this, um, these these clips again, so kind of pushing forward in time. And you can see in each of these um, time steps, the dark matter distribution is, is more extensive than the stellar distribution, but does um, track the central regions where the stars are concentrated. And then um, here, here at the end, um, you yeah, know, so the is what we what we're left with. And for sure, like there's definitely the dark matter distribution is broader. But again, it's, it's concentrated roughly where the stars are here. Um, so the, the stars are, I mean, they're not a perfect tracer for the dark matter, but they would be an indication that you would also have a component in the dark matter that's behaving in a similar way. 
Okay, thank you. Another question. I think you begin with the talk to mention the dark matter hello hello uh, version one. Well, yeah. end with dark matter hello version two. Uh, just make sure when was the transition from one to two? Uh, I mean, that was kind of um, perhaps uh, somewhat heuristic here, but uh, uh, I don't think we're done with version two. Put it that way. So version two is in progress. I mean, here, I mean, here's where we're at, right? So um, I think when I would claim that version two is done when we have a solid understanding of the dark matter that came from the luminous satellite galaxies, I think that's a big step forward. Um, and I think we're, we're getting there. Um, uh, especially I mean, because we've been, we've, the big boom there came from the Gaia data. So those advancements really just came in the last two years, um, following the second Gaia data release. Um, I would argue that version three, um, which we have yet to embark on, um, but is going to be the more complete picture, is going to include the dark matter that comes from these satellite galaxies that don't have any stars in them. The challenge there is obviously that, you know, what we've been able to, the, the thing we've been able to harness to make progress is really the fact that we have some kind of tracer in these galaxies, the stars, and we can see those tracers. Um, the challenge with this arm here is we, we no longer have the, the, the stars as being the tracers for those galaxies, so we're going to need to figure out other ways of, of tackling it. Okay, thank you very much. I have one more question, but in case there are other people want to ask, maybe they, they should ask first before I... Otherwise, I can ask one more question. Maybe I go ahead first. Uh, yeah. So the dark, dark matter hello uh, version one, I think the simulation data is using the collisionless fluid and with some mm -hmm. phase-based distribution and such as Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, isothermal density, etc. Uh, I wonder how how uh, how the fitting is constrained by the the by the by the the maybe the universality cost of the data, the input that you need to input. Like, is if you vary a bit the distribution, does that matter? And how is that com compared to further analysis that you did later when you try to maybe simulate dark matter? Do you always start with uh, this type of model, this uh, collision, this fluid? Or, yeah, or, that's or, a really good question. So um, all of the simulation that data that I've shown here has been um, making the assumption that the dark matter is collisionless. Um, the, the model, we refer to the model as cold dark matter model. Um, that's the dominant paradigm, but it's certainly, um, there's certainly very well motivated uh, modifications on that. Um, so for example, you can consider uh, the case where the dark matter is allowed to interact with itself. So it's like a self interaction. Um, and we've, we have started looking at what happens to this picture if the dark matter model is not cold and is instead, for example, self-interacting or perhaps if there's some certain amount of like dissipation in those self-interactions. Um, and it does, it will end up changing the correspondence between the um, dark matter distribution and the stellar distribution. So one of the reasons why you get such a nice mapping between the stars and the dark matter in the case of cold dark matter is because both the stars and the dark matter are collisionless, are effectively collisionless. So they, they act very similarly in their, in their evolution. Um, now, if you change the dark matter model so that for it's, for example, self-interacting, then you're, you're, you're breaking that tie between the two. Um, and um, in that case, um, you will end up seeing some differences in the distribution. So that's that's work in progress, but it's um, it's really important to understand exactly how these conclusions are affected by the properties of the dark matter model. Um, so it's something that we definitely need to um, explore further. Fortunately, we have the tools to be able to do so because we can model these self interactions and also these dissipative interactions in the simulations. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. Uh, just how much the methodology of of the, the the model of your dark matter affects your conclusion. I think that's a thing I want to maybe understand or separate. Maybe there are some more universal conclusion independent from which dark matter model you use. Well, part of the uh, explanation, part of the the conclusion might be affected by the model you use. Yeah, 
is this possible to be stated? So what, the, I have from, uh, what, I, what I'm sketching here on this slide, these conclusions won't be any different. So there will still be components of dark matter, like we would, the relative fractions of the components of dark matter coming from these different um, origins would still be the same, regardless of whether or not the dark matter is self-interacting or cold, for example. Um, what may change is um, the actual velocity distribution of the dark matter, let's say from Enceladus. If the dark matter is self-interacting versus cold, the velocity distribution of the dark matter from Enceladus will look different. Um, but all that means is that um, when we sort of put forward a, like a final distribution of that local dark matter map, we could just have several different like categories, right? If the dark matter is cold, then we expect the distribution to look like this. If it's if there's self interactions, then we can predict a distribution that looks like this, right? So um, we should be able to get a good handle on that um, from from the simulations. But what I've drawn here on this slide here, that won't change. Um, um, if, if you change, if you let's say switch from cold dark matter to SI, uh, self interacting dark matter. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, mm -hmm. one last thing, since dark matter is in general maybe uh, defined in a way, they are matter, but not belong to the standard model sectors. So if we have a, like experimental data, uh, is there a, a way we can just interpret dark matter by its own independent from what model we are using? But it seems like the, some of the analysis depends on the data input that we need to assume certain dark matter, dark matter model. So that's the part I, I feel like I'm not understand enough. Which part we need to assume that there is certain dark matter uh, model need need as an input, and which part we can just interpret from from the experiments, based on the fact that the uh, dark matter doesn't interact, that is, doesn't through interact with the strong force and electromagnetism, electromagnetic force. Can we already uh, read from the experiment data that we can just tell? Who, which parts from the dark matter? It seems like there's an input that you need to you, you need to you need to consider when, when you do the analysis. So from from this um, from this angle where we're trying to build up that dark matter distribution from astrophysical observables, um, what what we'll ultimately end up having is um, options for what that dark matter distribution will look like depending on the properties of the dark matter particle. Um, you know, so there'll be like option A, B, C, um, where A might be if it's cold, B if it's self-interacting, et cetera. Um, then let's say that you have an experiment, um, a terrestrial experiment that runs and actually sees a signal. And based off of the signal that they would see, um, they can get, um, that would actually, I mean, what you would test then is the consistency of that signal with options A, B, C, and D. Um, and then see which of those options is more consistent with what you're seeing in, in the data from your experiment. Um, and then in that way, you'd actually be able to, to directly test um, what the properties of that dark matter particle are. And you should be, you know, what would hope you'd be able to infer something about that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, uh, the speaker. Uh, if uh, anybody in the audience has any more questions, please ask them, uh, the speaker, directly over email or something. Thank you. We're, we're finishing this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.